Sorry to announce Metallica won't be making it tonight. First of all, I would like to let you know that that's my first video. I've been working 14 years in the music industry. I never did a video before. Um, it shows. We know we got a lot of fucking Metallica friends out there. And then uh, we start to rock out the crowd. It's getting crazy. And they're ready to go. So have a good time. Things are getting ugly. Me, me and my good buddy uh, 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 Andreas, we're here talking with James from Metallica. Howdy. Hi, Jason. Yeah. Hi, Stephen Rosen. How's it going? How you doing? Good. I appreciate you taking the time to, to do this. It sh this shouldn't take too long. <laughs> what? <laughs> to make rock and Definitely. It doesn't mean like touring three years straight. I mean, we've done that. We don't need to kill ourselves. Don't you fucking like to meet Cliff Burton, the major rager? I'm the four-string motherfucker. Here we go. Yes. There's a lot of shit that's taking place in the last six or eight months with me, man. It's got that angst and that, sure that uh, uh, urgency of, of some of the live stuff. After five years on the road, Metallica now seemed to be on their way to the very top. But tragedy awaited them. On September 27, 1986, the tour bus they were in crashed on a mountain road in Sweden. Bass player Cliff Burden was killed at the tender age of 24. That was, uh, that was really intense. I, you know, I was at the house that morning when, they got, when we got the call. And, um, you know, we thought it was Kirk because we just, you know, heard his mom. She was very upset on the phone, and and then um, she told us it was Cliff. And um, you know, it hit really hard. Cliff was a great guy, you know, and it, it affected a lot of people, not just the band, but I mean, you know, he had a lot of tight friends in the Bay Area, and and uh, and I think James, I think him and James were just like, were, they were like this. And he was really, you know, really affected, and it took him a long time. Oh, Cliff was the great. I mean, I think if Cliff was still alive, Metallica would be different as people. He's the one that kind of, you could tell how this is, you know, the slowly the success started getting to them. And, and Cliff was the only one that would, was always kind of keep, keep keeping them grounded, you know, to where he's like, don't let it get to you. And James looked up to, to Cliff, too. So there was a little bit of a tuggle going on, too, because Lars is more of a flashy kind of guy. He's like, oh, the rock star. And Cliff is more pure music, like people's kind of guy, you know? And then there's a tuggle going on, you know, and James is in between. James, is, you know, could be pulled either way. And then it, it was just the Lars and James team. You know, and Lars always felt, I mean, it was uh, that Cliff was in the way. I mean, you know, I mean, I know he, he would never admit it, you know, straight out, and it would be a bad thing for him to do so. But it, it was because James really looked up to, to Cliff. We all spoke to them. Um, and I'm sure Johnny Z spoke to them as well because he was probably still closer to them than than anybody I know I spoke to them and but it it was very much a decision that they had to come to themselves and they took a, some time off to decide what they were going to do but um, I always had the feeling that it was touch and go and that it could be it could have gone either way which and these things happen. I mean, you know, these things happen to a lot of groups. And one thing goes, you know, I mean, obviously in this case, it's something that went tragically wrong. I mean, it can't go worse. They completely changed after he left, which is one of the reasons why Master of Puppets is still so highly regarded, still so affectionately thought of by their fans, because once Cliff was gone, um, everything about that group changed. 
suddenly Lars and James are now the soul of the group. They're not just the writers and the career decision makers. They're, they're the glue, they're the soul, they're the vibe, they're the direction. And up until then, it had absolutely been clear. There's a school of thought that argues that if they hadn't lost him, they may not have become as hugely successful as they did because there was a line in the sand that Cliff drew which he wouldn't cross and he wouldn't allow those guys to cross. And one of those would be, for instance, releasing five singles from an album, which is what they went on to do just a few years later. Making videos, cutting their hair short, wearing makeup, all the stuff that Metallica went on to do in the 90s really wouldn't have happened if uh, Cliff had still been there. A mere month after Cliff's death, a new bassist was recruited. Jason Newsted, formerly with the B-League thrash metal band Flotsam and Jetsam, was suggested to Metallica by their old friend Brian Slagle, and after auditions of both his playing and his drinking ability, was asked to join the band. Cliff died um, midway through the Master of Puppets tour. It was in Scandinavia, so they still had quite a lot of com dates that they were yet to finish there. When Jason was confirmed as the uh, new bass player, they went back and actually played all of those shows that they that, that they hadn't played that were still on the itinerary. And that was a really brilliant move by them because it was a way of breaking Jason in in a low-key manner. It wasn't like they were coming out with a new album and they were going on, on a massive tour. It was, here's the new guy, we're doing a few shows for, uh, and we're also honouring our commitment to our fans, which I thought was was amazing considering nobody would have minded had they said, well, we won't do those shows now. Nobody was going to kick up a fuss. It was a really good idea for them to that the way they brought Jason in that way and it got everybody excited and on board ahead of what was to come. Right after the accident happened, we individually decided that, you know, the best way to get get rid of all our frustrations because we were very traumatized and we had, you know, we were very, we had a lot, we felt a lot of, you know, emotional, you know, distraught over the situation. We thought that the best way to get rid of our frustration was that one mine? would be to, 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 to hit the road, you know, and get all the anxiety and frustrations out on stage, you know, where they they, they should go, you know. They should go toward, a, you know, a positive thing like that. The, the worst thing we, we could do is just, like, sit in our room and sulk over the matter and, you know, wallow in, the, in our just think pity. Lower, lower, you just don't, don't want to go and do it again. If you, uh, you get to a stage where it, it feels so bad that you're not even sure you want to do it again. Yeah, exactly, you know, and, 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 the, and the more you think about it, the, the deeper you sink. So we thought... We each thought individually we have to we have to keep on going, we have to work because it wouldn't be fair to Cliff to just stop. Yeah. Also, if like Cliff were alive for some freak uh, uh, some reason or another and like, you know, he couldn't play bass, he wouldn't tell us to stop. He would want us to go <coughs> on. Yeah. I don't know, you know, that's the way he would have felt. He would have wanted us to go on. Yeah. So we had a band meeting and like that was the, the overwhelming, you know, decision to to go on. So we decided after the last rites, that, uh, you know, we should just sit down and start auditioning bass players. Yeah. First thing we realized was that we were never ever going to find anyone like Cliff, so it was not like we were sort of looking for a Cliff Burton the second or whatever, and we just needed, you know, a bass player that would, would fit in. Jason, that, you know, strong individual personality and so forth, and, you know, we'll see what happens when we start writing. We don't write on the road, so it's a little early to tell. I mean, we had like uh, names thrown about, and and, and uh, we asked like people in the industry, like you know, record company people, friends, you know, who had connections and stuff. And a name that kept on ch uh, uh, popping up was Jason Newstead, this guy right here. Yeah. And so it came time to audition him. So we we we. Um, Took the time out to like you know take our time with him because a lot of a lot of the people you just walk into the room you can tell no way this guy is gonna be in Metallica you know yeah. guy come in he's like stoned off his ass you know was walking into like Mike's tents and stuff 
I mean, we had a lot of those, okay? There's a, there's a lot of people there. Like, if they start the song, and you can just tell that their bass style wasn't the type of style. Gotta be able to fit in, cause or fit, you know, fit in with us know, personally. And the way that be living with this person, yeah, you know, exactly. And the way the mentality is, I mean, you know, it's like big family, man. You gotta we're, be able to be one of the pros. You gotta know, be able to be one of the part of the family. That's not only that, we were looking for a long-term thing. You know, yeah. we didn't, we didn't want just a hired hand. Jason came from a band called Flotsam and Jetsam, which they 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 were a metal band. They. uh they they were pretty good. I mean, some of their earlier stuff is is, is pretty cool. Um, I I don't know exactly why they got him. Maybe he fit in personnel wise or personality wise the best. Um, I mean, I I like Jason. He's a, he's a nice guy too. It was tough for Jason to come in and fill the spot, you know, not not even comparing them as players, but it's just even a personality. I think that was more than anything, you know, because because their styles are different. And, you know, and Jason does his thing. Cliff w was great in his own way. But the personality, you just couldn't, you know, you couldn't match that. If you want to make comparisons between him and Cliff, he's more of like a picking bassist and stuff like that, which is fine, I guess. But if you had come from someone like Cliff, who is like all fingers and just everywhere, I'd think you'd want to carry that on. Despite the constant bullying Jason received in his early months in Metallica, the new lineup gelled and their first music together appeared in the summer of 1987 on the Garage Days Revisited EP recorded in Lars's garage in San Francisco. It's so strange, isn't it, that Metallica, subsequent to Cliff Burton dying, got in a new basis, and the first thing they did was a covers EP with Diamond Head, Budgie, Misfits, and I think it actually was a very cunning and very clever move, because to go straight into the studio and do a new record with all new songs would have put an enormous amount of pressure onto Jason Newsted's shoulders. They introduced him into the Metallica way of doing things by doing something very different. It was a slightly unusual move, partly because of the songs that they covered. They covered um, songs from the new wave of British heavy metal. There was a song by Holocaust, there was a one by Diamond Head, but there was also a Killing Joke song as well, so there was something, something of Cliff's punk and post-punk influences going on there. So fucking what? I heard um, So What, I just thought it was Metallica, I didn't know, and then I found out later and I heard the original and I love that as well now, you know what I mean, but it doesn't matter to me, I just loved the way they'd put on the song and if it was their own, I'd have loved it. It was just totally different, nice to hear something like that. It is, it's a great song. I had it on my car constantly for one summer. <laughs> Windows down, fly by the school, full blast. <laughs> Metallica have recorded various punk songs, and to me, they do it by the numbers, really. It's, they don't have the punk edge, they don't have the punk rawness. Their aggression is entirely of the metal school. Nonetheless, it's, it, it's doable. Quite a few bands have attempted this. Megadeth did a cover of Anarchy in the UK. Slayer recorded a whole album of punk covers in 96. It can be done, but it doesn't really compare to the original stuff. Well, I fucked this, I fucked that. I've even fucked this schoolgirl. So what? So what? So what? So what? So what? Who 
you know, that's them just showing everyone where they come from in the same way that Bread Fan is as well. Um, Budgie, a very underrated band. Um, not really very light because they've got had a really stupid sounding singer and lots of very, very bizarre song titles like Hot as a Docker's Armpit and In the Grip of a Tire Fitter's Hand. So they weren't the most obviously commercial band ever, but they were quite good. Red Fan shows to me that when Metallica want to, how they can improve uh, their version of, an of a song like, over the original if they want. The original Brad Fan um, was a great song, but it wasn't recorded particularly with, with an awful lot of budget and an awful lot of aggression. When Metallica did it, their version was amazing. It was absolutely incendiary. It was really, really fast, really, really precisely played. And it has this old school, slightly bluesy element because the riff is based on a, on a bend. Brad Fan's a weird one because it's, um it is more more simplistic and it is more bluesy than than what than the kind of thing you'd expect them to do, but it sounds perfectly natural. I mean, I think there's there's other stuff that they've covered that doesn't sound particularly natural, but they were obviously having fun doing it. So you kind of go, oh well, you know, it's quite it's a laugh listening to them doing it. But a great song, you know, Kurt plays a brilliant solo in that one. It's it's very you know it's quite again quite simple, quite rock and roll, quite quite bluesy, but um, but it sounds like you know it does sound like Metallica. <laughs> And because he wasn't trying to emulate the solo at the time by a guy called Tony Ball, he did it in his own way. And because he did it in his own way, he put his own stamp on it, while strangely enough also paying an enormous amount of respect to the way the original sounded. So he did a really good job of crossing that bridge because you want a cover to sound enough like the original to recognize it, but sufficiently individual so it doesn't just sound like a note for note copy. It's not mimicking, it's emulating. After this promising start, it was a surprise that when the next full Metallica album, and Justice For All, appeared in 1988, it contained almost no bass. James and Lars had asked the mixers to remove it almost completely. Add to this the fact that the album was too technical in its arrangements for most fans, and it's clear that something of a crossroads was approaching for Metallica. There are, I mean, there are reasons why people don't regard it with quite the same level of, you know, of love and, and kind of hysterical enthusiasm that they do Master of Puppets and uh, the production is one, you know, the, that clicky kick drum sound which is actually quite irritating. Um, the fact that you can't hear the bass guitar, it's a very stripped down album in some ways uh, and, and because the songs are actually more progressive and more complex and more kind of self-indulgent than anything they've done before, if it had had the production that Master of Puppets or Ride the Lightning had, a, a bigger, warmer, you know, fuller sound, perhaps it wouldn't, you know, it would have been as, as revered as Master of Puppets. It was decided, and I use it was rather than the band decided, because I'm not convinced they ever went along with it wholeheartedly, but it was decided that Mike Klink, who'd worked with Guns N' Roses on Appetite for Destruction, should be the guy to produce what was to be Unjustice for All. And they went into the studio and it did not work. And they spent ages trying to make it work and eventually ran out of money and ran out of time or came close to running out of both. And they did the only thing that was logical. They ran back to the guy they understood, Fleming Rasmussen, and said, help, we need to make an album, and fast, and not much money, because a lot of the budget is gone on things we're never going to use. So there's a feeling of rushing it. And I think that's part of the reason why the bass is so low, because I think they rushed everything, and probably didn't realize at the time, the bass is fairly heavily mixed down. You can't hear Jason Newsted. There is no bass on that album. Where, where is, is the biggest question in Metallica is, uh, career that everybody asks and there is no answer. Jason, you said, obviously plays bass on it. You see the songs live and there are bass lines, but in way of production, it was certainly not there. I interviewed Jason a couple of years ago for my book and he told me that while Justice was being mixed, it had been recorded, while it was being mixed, they were touring on the Monsters of Rock thing with Van Halen and the rest of them. And in between shows, 
James and Lars were driving down to the studios where the album was being mixed. And at one point, they said to the mixers, take the bass down to where you can barely hear it, and then knock a dB off the top of that as well. So I said to Jason, well, why would they do this? You know, you're a great bass player. And they said they had a multitude of reasons. One of them was they weren't too confident about his skills when he was replacing Cliff. Secondly, um, there was a slight click because his plectrum was hitting the strings. But that's stupid because you can take that out anyway uh, in the production. Um, so it would seem simply that they, they, they didn't really want his presence too high on the album. Or, um, or you could spin it the other way and say that the guitar sound, which James had used on the album, was so vast that in fact it was appropriate to take up the bass frequency space, but it's, it's endlessly debatable. I think Metallica effectively disappeared out their own arseholes on Unjustice for All. From the first album to the second album and the third album, they, they upped the ante. And I think they thought the only way to really up the ante here was to be more complex, more dark lyrically, um, you know, and it just, the, what they forgot was that they hadn't really written any great riffs they're all very, very good composition, but they're all very uncomfortable. And I think that's the point people make these days with Unjustice for All. It's not a happy album, it's not a pleasant album, and it's an album that you feel a little bit you, like you want to back away from. On Unjustice for All, you got the first fruits of, you know, the first signs that um, James Hetfield was beginning to sing about himself a bit more, particularly on Dyer's Eve, which is about his horrendous childhood and how, you know, how appallingly his dad you know would treat him and that he had quite religious parents you know and how you know dim the dim view they took of everything that James Hetfield stood for and how he felt that he was a disappointment to them and how they were cruel to him and all this kind of stuff you know. The lyrics on Injustice for All for the first time were political. They didn't really allude directly to any particular institutions or organisations but it was apparent that rather than singing about Satan and all those ridiculous cliches as they had done on early records they weren't singing about biblical plagues in Egypt anymore they were singing about subjects much closer to home. Lars is drumming at the beginning of one when they're playing, when it's the kind of mellow acoustic part, is a bit heavy handed, shall we say. <laughs> and I think some producers would not have mixed his, his, his kick drum and snare quite as loud as they did on, on one because it is kind of like, you know, they're playing these beautiful harmonies and stuff on the guitars and then there's this bloke hitting biscuit tins in the background, you know, which doesn't which doesn't help, you know. But I don't think there's anything wrong with his drumming per se on it. I think it's just the way it's mixed. It's just not, you know, it is a bit, you know, um, a bit ham-fisted, really. Lars has never been credited as being the best drummer ever. Nonetheless, but that shouldn't take away from the fact that he is a highly competent drummer. One thing that does annoy a few people is that occasionally he doesn't know when to lay back and take it easy. Um, an example might be the first section of one, which is supposedly a, m a melodic sort of quiet section. He could have laid off a little bit. There's another song on Reload called uh, Unforgiven 2, which is extremely quiet and mellow in its first section, and Lars is all over the place hitting the snare. He could really have done some rim shots or something just to keep it down a little bit, but that's his style. But you actually listen to this song and it's so claustrophobic. It's about someone who's alive inside, who can't communicate. And there is an element there of James Hetfield, because I think to some extent he was alive inside, but couldn't actually feel he could communicate his despair and the fact he was slowly falling into the trap of allowing his demons to come out. It's a band who are angry because Cliff Burton had died. It's a band who are depressed because of that, but a band who are also determined. There, there's a real feeling sometimes of tracks like Harvester of Sorrow, which is about a drug addict who kills his own family. That's a bit shocking sometimes. It, it's not a happy album. Obviously the Sorrow is quite pedestrian, it plods along, it's, you can understand why it was released as a, as a single, you can understand why people like it live, but realistically it's just a bit average. They should have been writing another Orion, you know, or another Battery or something like that, and instead it's just this kind of, uh, just really sort of tepid and, you know, generic Metallica song. You know, it's like they, they didn't want to become formulaic, but I think it was like one of the first signs that Metallica were starting to run out of ideas. I think we made other people aware that heavier music was out there and it was actually music <laughs> and that there were people that liked it. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever's popular doesn't mean it's good, basically. Mm -hmm. We opened the door, I think, uh, once our underground following was so huge, you know, they wanted to see, they're calling MTV, where's the Metallica video, who, you know, and radio. They had to pay attention to us. Yeah. And it opened all these doors for 
uh, grunge stuff, you know, it was more accepted on, you know, now on a, you can't watch TV without seeing a commercial with some, uh, you know, aggressive, aggressive music yeah, in it. That's true. I, you know, 10 years ago, I would have flipped out to hear, you know, yeah. even if it was just Aerosmith or some kind of rock Motor on the, head to, yeah, head. anything on the TV. But now it's so acceptable. And that's, that's, if we've helped open the door, that's, that's fine. <laughs> What seems to be happening now a lot in, in heavy, whatever you want to call it, is that people are so worried about things like guitar players are very worried about, you know, speed and things like that. Drummers are very, you know, play as fast as they can and being as flashy as possible. And, and I think what is going on is that I think most people sort of care more about those kind of things than an actual feel for the music, which I think is very dangerous. And I think that the current heavy metal scene is, is really moving away from from when I think that it peaked in, you know, 81, 82. I think that bands have no sort of individualities anymore. They have no personalities. They're all just sort of, everyone's just copying what everyone else is doing. Everyone is playing it very, very safe. No one is sort of just taking chances and sort of trying to do things a bit different. But, like, I'm really worried about that people are really losing like a feel for the music which is something that i think through the 60s and the 70s and up to a few years ago people you know the whole thing was very much centered around people's feel for you know different instruments and feels for songwriting and so forth <laughs> important for an album to come out and become a classic wow uh we're still working on that you know you always it's never the best never you can always do it better and you're never satisfied mm -hmm. which is not a bad thing you know you always you always want to find that perfect thing you know and uh that's what kind of drives you uh i think the drive and the the will to try new things mm -hmm. to experiment and to push each other <laughs> It was time for a change of direction. In 1990, Metallica had a meeting with well-known producer Bob Rock, who had worked on successful albums by Motley Crue and The Cult. Rock told Metallica that in his opinion, they had never captured on record the intensity of their live shows. After some discussion, Lars and James decided to bring him on board for the next record. It was a decision that would shape their entire career. It was the end of the line there. There's no way they could go any further down that line. They had to do something radically different. And what they did was reinvented themselves so brilliantly that, I mean, it was just, it was a masterstroke, the Black Album. The last thing you want Metallica to do was keep on releasing the same album. You know what I mean? Because they've never done that, so why would they start? Yeah. I think it's good, the progression's good. The progression is good, and it got them a million times more fans, you know, so it's still one of the biggest selling albums. So. The first four albums, it's just Metallica and it's fantastic and they were the coolest band on the planet. The Black Album, they weren't our band anymore, you know, as, as, a, as a committed metalhead, they stopped being my band then and they became loads of other people's band instead. Let's put it this way, the Black Album, Metallica's big commercial breakthrough, was designed that way. It was tailored to be big. However, I still maintain this is the darkest album they ever made. It was a, it was a very successful one. Even, even, my, even myself, I actually like the Black Album. Um, 
you, you know, you know, even though I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I'm among my comrades in the thrash metal community that, 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 that I ha hang, hang out with, they had just gone so mainstream. It was just ridiculous how, how mainstream they were. But, but you know what? Uh, compared to how the other day, they still had their uh, roots in metal, and it was still a heavy metal record. They always try to evolve and create something new. I mean, if you, it, just even from Kill em All to Ride the Lightning, you saw the progression. Ride the Lightning to Master, same thing, you know, into the Black Album. And I think after the Black Album, they kind of got in, the, in that comfortable zone. The point of the Black Album, why it's a great album, is that, yes, there are quite a lot of average tracks, but they loaded it up, didn't they, with a load of really, really big songs at the start of the record. and. It, I mean, it sounded brilliant as well. Bob Rock did a fantastic job. What Bob Rock had introduced to the band at that time was not so much the impetus to write stripped down simpler songs. I think that came from James and Lars themselves. But what he did do was beef up sound as a full bass presence. He made it radio friendly. You've got to remember he'd worked with people like Motley Crue before he worked with Metallica. He knew how to make an album sound good on MTV through a little TV speaker or on the radio or whatever. Um, so really he facilitated their desire to write simpler songs. It, people blame Bob Rock for too much. It's not like he sat down with them in the songwriting room and said, you can't do this, you've got to do that. What he did do was give them a very, very nice mainstream sound. <laughs> The Black Album is sonically, in one sense, sonically perfect. It's probably got the best production on it of any metal album ever, but it is more pedestrian, it's more middle of the road, it's more commercial, it's more simplistic. In many ways they regressed at that point, because if you look at the songs, they're the most straightforward bu bunch of songs they'd written since Kill Em All. In fact, in some ways more so, they're much more tradi traditional in, in terms of structure. They took 10 steps backward you know, in their songwriting. I mean, it's just, and there's great songs on there, but they, 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 they no longer were progressing as a creative band, they were progressing as a commercial band. Brilliant record, but it's not exciting. I think that's the thing, and it should have been, you know. But then would they have sold 14 million albums if they'd, if they'd you know, done Master of Puppets 2, fast, brutal, progressive? No, they wouldn't have done, they'd have sold about three copies. Black Album was a tough record to make. Um, a lot of stress, a lot of arguing, a lot of difference of opinions and stuff like that. Come on, let's cut the shit and start working. Cut to the chase and fucking play, okay? All right, man. Now that you've uh, you know warmed up, let's hear the fucking guitar player of the year solo. Um, I think also just Bob from where he was coming from, where we were coming from, it just. It was a pretty ugly record to make. What is your problem? I don't the have heavy a guitars aren't loud enough. Okay, he walked in and said dynamics when they come in, you don't sense that the heavy guitar is coming. Right, that they're not loud enough. The rest of the shit. They're that, not loud enough. What is the problem? You could start by taking the I don't want to take the other things down because when those things were down when I heard them, there was nothing there. It there needs to be up. There. It, yeah, it need, those things need to be up during the shots. It goes bum, bum. It's not bum, bum. It sounded stupid, so I turned the button because it's the only thing there. It's the only piece of music in those shots besides the drums and the bass. So they turned them up. So the next section has to come in strong. It does come in strong. The only thing that doesn't come in strong is the guitars. I'll let you guys duke it out on this one because I frankly I don't give a fuck. I'm tired of arguing. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> you're not tired of arguing. <laughs> I'm sick and fucking tired of arguing. This is about a man who, or a person who can't sleep. This is about a man who gets into a different world, a different dimension, a different mindset because of the nightmares he's having. This is the man who can't actually deal comfortably with what life is doing. 
That makes it such a dark record for me. It's the intro and as soon as the riff came in on, on Enter Sandman, you knew that they got it back. We know they're going to play Enter Sandman as an encore because it's the, the biggest selling record they've ever had, you know, and it is a brilliant song and it does work live, but um, you listen to the album and it's so glossy and so polished and so overblown and so huge sounding, uh, you can't hope to reproduce that live. Slightly scary lyrics that make you want to look under the bed. After a good start. Nice bit of wah wah from Kirk on the on the playing there. Some nice feel. Great drumming from Lars. You don't hear those words in that order in the same sentence many times, do you? Um, actually, he's a better drummer than people give him credit for. I mean, come on. I don't think you can be the drummer in Metallica and be rubbish. That album took everybody by surprise. And then when it came out, actually, it made complete sense. I don't think anybody expected it to sell as hugely as it did or to, be, to receive as much MTV and radio exposure as it did. But when you look back on it, and it's 15 years ago now, it's, it's the obvious thing for Metallica to have done at that juncture in their career. They couldn't have known that the, the rock was going to change so dramatically. Nobody did. My God, if they'd have made an album like um, Justice at the time of the grunge hitting, they could have been in real trouble because they would have looked like some you know, Led Zeppelin or Yes or something, because it was a very overwrought kind of thing. This, by um, by comparison, was was perfect, and it set the album up. I mean, if you want to set an album up with what the new Metallica is all about, I mean, couldn't ask for any better than Enter Sandman. One, one of the great things with the Black Album is it allowed James Hetfield for the first time to prove what a great voice he had. He'd done it before, but no one had realized because it was all locked in with the metal theme and the, the power, the passion, the energy, the riffs. So that what James did sometimes got a little lost, but on the track like Nothing Else Matters, he suddenly was allowed to sing and sing with a lot of depth and feeling and got through to people who thought, God, that guy doesn't just growl. He can really sing. All of a sudden he's just like singing this really weepy and bleeding and slightly embarrassing and absurd adolescent thing about a breakup you know that was supposed to happen years before but you know he couldn't remember you know I mean it's just like who is that supposed to appeal to not metalheads people who wanted to flick their light around people who grew up with Bon Jovi who grew up, grew up with the kind of cock rock and hair metal that thrash was there to destroy you know I mean Bon Jovi was the Antichrist and Metallica was there to, to right their wrongs yeah, that, 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 that's what you listen to all that other shit for, you know, Metallica is supposed to be there kicking ass. Sad but true, first of all you've got this massive down-tuned guitar riff, but also James has a very sort of staccato, percussive, forceful vocal, which comes through, it's not over complex, it's basically shouting words like hate, hate, I'm your hate, sort of almost anthemic, repeated sort of way. And it's like, doon, do 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 do. Doing, you know, just this really, really simple but powerful kind of thing. He didn't have to be doing, you know, double kick drum or just like some insane kind of fill or whatever else, you know, because it's just like, that's all the song needed. The Black Album soared up the charts in dozens of countries around the world. Metallica embarked on a huge tour that lasted three years, earning hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue and stamping their identity on the music scene forever. The band were now part of the rock establishment. We were on the road for Bordering on three years, the tour was the longest tour we've been on, probably the longest tour anybody's been stupid enough to go on. And it was, um, but you know what? We had a record that could carry that kind of tour, and it was the right thing to do, and it was the right time to do it. Uh, we got a chance to play to a lot of places that we might never go back to. A lot of countries opened up to us. And um, we came back to places like um, the UK and Europe and stuff like that three times on, on the run. So it was it was a great thing. After that, we really were um, in need of some serious time off for the first time in our career. Uh, we really needed to get away from Metallica for a while. The last 12 years you've been touring, studio, touring, studio, touring, yeah. and I won't go on. Especially yeah. the Black Album tour, that was a big one, right? The monster, yeah. Yeah, how this affect your life, like as a personal <laughs> lives, if you have any? I didn't have one, that was the problem. <laughs> as 
bands get bigger and shit gets bigger, just like us, probably with any business, but mostly with an artist, you let other people start making decisions for you. Right. There's all kind of people hired around you, paying, paid good money to make you comfortable and keep things hidden from you so that you're all on the even keel and shit, and you can create your art. Right. That's real easy to get used to. You're a human being. I mean, after people are pampering you and wiping your ass and everything else, after a while, it's, you know, you're like, hey, this is not bad. And all of a sudden, you have to get your own coffee and shit. You're going, hey, hey, man, I'm somebody special. I should, you know, be take care of whatever yeah. that just spoiled, pampered bullshit. Mm -hmm. And I realized it. You know, actually, I was lucky enough to realize it about 1992, 93. <laughs> when the Black Album hit, we all went into about a six-month spin of like, holy fuck, where's all this money coming from? And then, <laughs> you know, and then after that, I mean, fortunately, I think that I got a hold of it myself pretty quickly. It took others longer to come out of it. A solid fucking year was touring in America, and not a lot of people do that, believe me. <laughs> I mean, we hit cities that nobody's, like, ever heard of. But they had a fucking ice hockey arena there, so we showed up and so did 10,000 other people. It was great. Hello, girls. Metallica has made a career of cutting across the grain, but their non-conformist ways don't always work. Case in point was Friday night's unfocused rambling concert at Knickerbocker Arena. Blah, blah, blah. Kind of like Led Zeppelin, the song remains the same. Look at this thing. Here we I, go. I guess these things just went down in value. Uh, if we can win one, I guess anybody can, huh? Yes, and the best metal performance is... Roy Rogers. All right, Roy. Metallica. Couldn't they give us a few more minutes after that? Ah, anyway, let's get on with it. Thank you. You want a job? <laughs> um, let's see. I think the first thing we got to do is obviously, like you guys were expecting this, we got to thank Jethro Tull for not putting out an album this year, right? <laughs> In less than a decade, they had risen from the underground beginnings in the clubs of San Francisco to a position where the world lay at their feet. While the future looked rosy, 
the pressure of being the biggest metal band in the world was building beneath the surface. After the enormous Black Album tour, I think Lars and James in particular had started to, to burn out. And after some time out, they realized that they really needed to think carefully about the future of Metallica. Could they keep on knocking out these thrash metal albums or these radio-friendly heavy metal albums? And in fact, the decision they made when they came back in 1996 with Load was to take an alternative rock direction, which horrified lots of people. Five years in terms of calendar years, but, but basically uh, just uh, tons of work and and it's, I think it's gone really quick, actually, so there you go. Yeah, it, it, seem, it seems like just a, just a, a flash. I mean, I, I can remember doing this, the same sort of thing back in 1991. I mean, it, it's, it's gone by really, really quickly, the whole thing the whole five years because I mean it was not like we were just like sitting sitting around you know by the pool I mean we we worked from for like you know for those five years I think actually between the black album and 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 load we kind of got a little bit of an anchor at home you know okay we got a place to live you know <laughs> uh, found a girlfriend you know <laughs> things now, that usual uh, people do sometimes huh? normal things normal things, yeah, yeah that we really don't know how to do, but uh, Lars and I have since gotten married, not to each other, but <laughs> <laughs> we've been married for 14 years. I mean, that's old news, but uh, <laughs> you know, we've, we found the right woman, you know, and uh, we, each of oh, us has got married. Here. Those, you got the yeah, ring. I got the ring. I actually just put it on for the, for the interview. <laughs> <laughs> for the wife to see. Yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. We went in uh, April, the end of April of 95, mm -hmm. in uh, Sausalito, Sausalito, California, yeah. the record plant, um, which is pretty close to, really close to Lars's place, close to James, all, you know, within an hour of all of us, basically. Mm -hmm. That's the first time we've ever recorded at home. We've got to stay in our own beds at night and that kind of thing, up to up till now, you know, Denmark or Los Angeles, sure. wherever it happened. The idea was to do a double CD with all these songs. And we recorded all the drum tracks, and it ended up taking a really long time, and we just knew we wouldn't meet any time schedules, you know, we'd be in the studio for a couple of years, that's not what we want to do. Mm -hmm. We worked one notch lesser in terms of, of the stress level. This is the first record we've ever made at home in San Francisco, and we kind of told ourselves that we would rather the record take, you know, two, three months longer, and we don't kill ourselves or each other doing it. So um, this has definitely been the least difficult record for us. I mean, it was difficult and, and, and so on, but it was the least difficult and the least stressed out record we've made. We went in with that idea of doing those 29 songs, right? That This task, can we do this double CD? Get six months in, do those drum tracks. Kirk told me that you recorded drum tracks back in 95. Or, <laughs> and yeah. That's part of the drum oh, track. I remember but, drum tracks, yes. Yeah. Look at each other, have kind of a team meeting and go, this is not, you know, going to work because we have to have that light up there to see, to go on tour and do all that thing. We mm -hmm. want to get out in the summer, not miss the generation of listeners, let people know Metallica's alive and well and kicking, you know, we want to get it going again, get, get it flowing. So uh, that happened, decided those 14 songs came back around and we moved everything to New York on March 1st, the whole operation, to finish up with vocals and some guitar stuff and then the mastering. The material that we had it, it basically kind of wrote itself. So a lot of the riffs, we weren't, we weren't so concerned about, okay, here's a great riff, and now we're going to put a bunch of other riffs around it and mm. construct the song certain ways. We just got some, some just straight ahead great riffs and, and built on just the one riff and kind of let other things happen around it. and I would take Kirk or whoever's riff, start jamming on it, and then other things would flow out of it. Instead of trying to put all these pieces of a puzzle together, right. the song kind of helped write itself. And in turn, they got their own feel. Uh, more, there's, there's definitely some greasier stuff on there. Sure. Some more hard-edged picking. There's just 
different, more jamming feels to it all, I think. sit down and, and, and make a Metallica record, there isn't a lot of criteria because we're so instinctive. With Load, you know, it was, it was it was a whole shock for the company. It was a combination of them all being short-haired and GQ looking, and with with, with, with the complete change in musical direction that, 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 they, that, they, that they went into. It seems like uh, Metallica are making excuses. Hey, it's not because of our hair; it's because of our it's because of our music. I mean, I say it's a it's a big, you know, corporate decision that 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 they, that they made. If uh, if they still wore leather jackets, bullet belts, and uh, long hair, uh, MTV wouldn't play their videos, and you know that for a fact. They they would have been looked at as some '80s thing. So they went and tried to uh, conform the, 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 their style and their look to what was accessible. For today on, on MTV, and I guess you know they're trying trying to appeal to to a younger audience. The album Load sold millions, but divided the fans and critics sharply. I think it was the beginning of the end of the close relationship that Lars and James had enjoyed for at that point 15 years, now nearly a quarter of a century since they first met. Lars took time out to become a bit of a trendy, started collecting art enjoyed the money and fame that went with the huge success of the Black Album. James went off and I think started to self-analyze what he wanted to do. And by the time they got back together to do a record, I think there were two camps within Metallica. One was James and Jason wanting to do heavy stuff because that's what Metallica was. The other being Lars and to a lesser extent Kurt saying, no, we should continue to explore music Look what's been going on. Oasis have happened in England. We got Blur, you got all these great bands who are suddenly starting to come out and we want their influence to show in our music. And I think there was a confusion in the way that Metallica wanted to represent themselves, which is shown in the photos they did for promotion of Load, which had Kirk and Lars in makeup and James and Jason looking very bemused. And I think Load is a very bemused album. They've kind of gone too far now. It's like. They'd almost be making, it, with Lowe, it's almost like an effort to make a normal rock record. You know, it's, it's, it's sounds like sort of movie parts. It's, it's not right. It's a three out of five record, whereas like in the Black Art been a five out of five record. Yes, it's still, it's still big. It's still got the sound of the band there, but they're, they're, they're kind of doing styles of music which doesn't suit them necessarily. You know, they come from a scene that, 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 that was very underground scene, mainly mainstream, and now they're just making normal rock record music. And it's the first one where the fans start to get a bit confused and, and the fans don't like it as so much. It's still a big selling record, but people are not quite so sure about it. People are scratching their heads going, hmm, not quite so sure about this, you know. It's salvation, if it does have a salvation, is that the production is very comfortable and straightforward and easy, and the songs, or more often than not, the songs are good. Do you get bothered? How do you react? How's your daily life uh, living with this? Uh, the opinions. Uh, you know, it doesn't. It doesn't bother me. I. L we laugh a lot of the, uh, uh, at a lot of them. It's uh, pretty interesting to 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 find out what people really think. You know, For what you, they spend yeah. their time thinking about is more. You know, there's a lot of really bored people out there that I think overanalyze Metallica. <laughs> <laughs> We're four guys that like to make music, you know, yeah. pretty much. And they take little things. Oh, make they get out the big glasses and what's going on there? <laughs> Metallica didn't seem to care about their detractors' opinions. After all, they've been through it many times before. But when they released a second album of middleweight rock tunes in 1997 called Reload, even they had to take notice of the fans' opinions. Reload was mediocre at best, and many of Metallica's most loyal followers hated it. Reload is the second worst Metallica album ever. It's Now, I don't know if this is true, but to me it sounds like the leftovers from Load. Stuff that they had lying around and thought, well, we think it's pretty good, we'll put it together and shove it out. So is Reload a continuation of Load, uh, musically, spiritually? <laughs> Brilliant, yes. Yes, it is. Me and James wrote about 30 songs, and we went in the studio and recorded 30 songs. So we actually didn't record one album while we were away. We actually basically recorded two albums. Uh, why have you decided to have this connection with the, these two albums? 
usually you were doing right. so much different stuff from album to album, from ride right. to... Well, we wrote all these songs at one time. We wrote 30 songs. Uh, and we just didn't finish them all in time for Load to come out. Mm -hmm. So these are the rest of the songs. They're not, uh, they're not the crappier ones. They're not mm -hmm. the ones that were, eh. They're the ones that didn't get finished. So we want these songs to come out. And the only time we feel that they have some relevance we'll should be, be now, you know? It's it's just part two of the record they'd already done, which people are not so, quite so sure about. It's not quite the Metallica that people really want, you know. Fuel, which, although it was an averagely good song, was easily the best song on the album, which I think is quite indicative of the quality of Reload. It was really quite poor. It was almost as if Metallica had, had, had lost their enthusiasm. Quite sure what was in the back of their mind doing Reload. It surely couldn't have been the idea of James and Jason to do it. I suspect they knew they were due a break. I suspect they wanted a break from each other. I also suspect there may have been some record company pressure saying, well guys, you're supposed to deliver an album in 1999. Well, okay, so I'll tell you what, you got all this stuff left over, let's make an album from it. But whatever, it was a huge mistake. Maybe a little better than a load, but it still sucked. Three years from now, the songs, you know, might not uh, fit us anymore. But the music is different than load. It's heavier. Uh, we heard like six songs today. The music okay. is more, uh, I would say, yeah, heavier, more moody. Okay. Uh, the load had more straightforward manner. Yeah, I think so, I think so as well. Yeah, load was a lot more down the middle. Mm -hmm. There's there's a, it's a wider variety this time as well. Uh, big, fat, Black Sabbath type songs, uh, stripped down, kind of folksy song. Uh, it's, I think it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty exciting record, I think. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really fun to work on the songs right now. As the decade drew to a close, it seemed that Metallica were on a downhill slide. Although they still went on huge tours and grossed large fortunes, an increasing number of metal fans doubted the quality of their music. In 1998, they released a covers album, Garage Inc., and followed it the next year with s and a live album recorded with the San Francisco Symphony Orchestra. Both sold respectably, but by this stage, it had been almost a decade since the band had released a truly great album. So what else is happening with the band? Uh, we're just taking a break right now. We're going to be, um, we're going to be uh, doing a video for uh, uh, a song for the Mission Impossible soundtrack. Oh, very cool. Yeah, and that's going to be coming out pretty soon. And, uh, and after that, we're going to take uh, some more time off and then hopefully get some, uh, some stuff together, some songs together, and, and tour this July. Oh, really? So you're actually going to go out on the road again? Yeah, we're going to play a handful of dates uh, scattered across the states. And then after that, we're going to take some more time off and then start writing, and hopefully we'll be in the studio by the end of, uh, end of the year. Let's we'll see how that goes. The final nail in the coffin seemed to come in 2001, when Lars Ulrich outraged literally millions of music fans by announcing that Metallica were suing a file-sharing program manufacturer called Napster. Essentially, Lars stood out as a figurehead for Metallica. He was protecting their own back, their, their own back catalogue and their own revenue. I think people thought at the time, Lars, you're just trying to save yourself money. But it wasn't really about that. There was money involved. Lars was very, very open about that. He said, yes, we're saving ourselves. A, you know, Napster are, are taking away a bit of money from us. But the bigger point here, which people failed to understand, and I think largely do still fail to understand, is that what he was talking about was artist rights. And the fact that if you're an artist and you create something, you should have control over that thing. It was about control, really. People didn't really understand that. And I think his reputation will never recover from the Napster fiasco. By the end of 2001, Metallica were in trouble. The Napster case had cost them a lot of fans. Bassist Jason Newsted had left after 14 years, angry that James wouldn't let him play music with other bands. Are you still, you, Kirk and Lars, doing most of the uh, music 
writing? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Is that the case that Jason does write or he's a lazy bum or? <laughs> <laughs> he's definitely not lazy. Uh, he takes too many vitamins actually, I think. Yeah, he's got a strange color. <laughs> too much ginseng. But he's, uh, uh, some of the material, well, the material was written two years ago, so yeah. there's not going to all of a sudden be some Jason songs on this because it was uh, written, you know, two years ago. It's just, well, the kind of the thing was, I always felt Metallica that they never let my ideas really get past their earlobes. They just didn't, not, not only didn't they let it get into their thought patterns, I mean, they just didn't even hear the words. So it's... Uh, just that's kind of the way that it was for a long time, and, mm -hmm. and so I, I mean, after a while, what the fuck? I can't, you know, that's no good for anybody. That's not healthy for anybody. No, absolutely. I mean, a person that was like a yes man or a go along kind of person or a, you know, that kind of meeky person would have. Oh, I gotta stay with you. It's where my money's coming from. Oh my mm -hmm. god, mm -hmm. or whatever. But that's just not really the way it is, man. It the, you know, when we write songs. We, we close our eyes, you know, we don't see whose name is on the tape, you know. Yeah. When it's good, it's good, you know. It works, yeah. It, that's how Metallica works. Easily the most difficult decision I've ever had to make in my life. I'm sure it was, and, and so, was, you know, but it had to be. Um, being together 15 years in closed spaces and more or less being married to each other, um, should be able to understand and give each other the space that you need in order to you know see what makes people tick I mean, mm -hmm. it was not hard to see after being around me for more than about 10 minutes to see what makes me tick i mean it's where there has to be music taking mm -hmm. place and if there's not then i am basically depressed so i mean that's all there is to it that's how it's always been since i started playing music and um i wasn't about to change it for anybody for any dollars or any bullshit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. see how that something like as beautiful as Echo Brain and something as different as Echo Brain could give Metallica any kind of competition and right. sound anything like it. If it was a watered down thing or I had some heavy band going yeah. or blah, right. you know, death metal thing and I would understand exactly. somebody's going, oh that might threaten our the integrity of our heaviness or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the and since Echo Brain is so different, I could not see how it could ever affect the people that came to sit in the seats at the live shows, or the people that went to buy the retail albums, or the people that bought the t-shirts, or the fans that have been around for years and continued to grow snowballing forever and ever, generation after generation, coming to listen to Metallica. I could not see how that this beautiful music could ever affect that. It's, you know, like a porch jam project that went to, you know, next level other places, absolutely. What's your review? Quick review. <laughs> He's saying, forget about it. It was good. It was a lot of fun. It was good to see Jason doing something good. I feel really good about it. You know, I'd be pissed off if I didn't like it, but I liked it a lot, and I feel really good about it. Yeah, you because know, I want him to get it. He's my bro. Going away, you know, like going back to grassroots type of stuff. Very good for cleansing. There's a lot of shit that's taken place in the last six or eight months with me, man. And now it's like a, in some depression for a while, you know? And then, I mean, I, it would have to be. You think about what's taking place, you know? I didn't want to step away from the thing. It wasn't like 100%, oh yeah, let's go, you know, like yeah. get out of here. It weren't like that. It's just something I had to make a decision as a man. You know, like what, you know, what my line is. If somebody crosses that line, then I gotta say stop. You know what I mean? That's what it came to. Yeah. So um, Echo Brain is just another one of the projects that I have as an ongoing thing. Just growing up together. I mean, that it is family, no doubt. And mm. uh, some of us have 
strong family lives, some don't. So this is really family for, for quite a few of us. And, and, to, and to not respect your family uh, is wrong. And we all really keep each other in line. We all keep tabs on each other you know, with the Metallica sarcasm. We have it really, it's funny, but it cuts and it works. <laughs> With relationships much improved in the band, they turned towards the new album. Writing the songs as a collective for the first time, the band found a new aggression and purpose in the music. It was a bit heavier and a bit faster than what had appeared before, certainly faster than anything that appeared in the 1990s. They'd rediscovered an element of what we call thrash metal. Lars was playing fast snare patterns once again, which hadn't done for a while. But this was true on a couple of songs. It wasn't, it didn't, it wasn't the case throughout the album. The original music is far more complex and stranger and much more original than the later records that they've become more of a rock band. In the 90s, they became more of a normal rock band. And St. Anger's an attempt to get out of that, you know. The most notable thing about St. Anger, and certainly the thing that most people pick up on when they don't like it, is the sound. What's, what Lars did was detune the snares on the side of his snare drum, which means that instead of getting a normal snare sound, you get a kind of boom noise when you hit it, and this is prevalent throughout the album. Now, a lot of people hated this, um, and thought, why, why have you done this? Why have you gone back to sort of basic garage values? And it all ties in with the fact that Metallica wanted to rediscover some of their early spirits, so it makes sense. Bob used old microphones. He didn't bother tuning James's vocals. You can, hear, you can hear James hit the odd wrong note vocally. And all in all, the album sounded deliberately unsophisticated. This, this divided the fan base. Some people admired the fact that it was a, a deliberate hark back. Other people, like me, really couldn't stand it. Uh St. Anger, I mean, I mean, I can't believe Bob Rock did such a great job producing the other albums. Uh, saying it's like the worst production job I've ever heard on any album. It's just, God, what is it? Like people are calling it, you know, trash can drums. It's just really like, like you, you, you gotta be kidding me. And, and yeah, the album is faster and heavier and, and, and is an angry sound, sounding album, but it just, the songs just aren't that good, you know? And by and large, the album just didn't have that quality that Metallica had had been so insistent on it in their previous records, even on records which were relatively unsuccessful, like Load and Reload. At least you had some melodies, you had some catchy stuff, you had some heavy stuff as well, you had all the metallic elements. On, on St. Anger, really, everything sounded very average. With St. Anger in the can, Metallica concentrated on finding a new bass player. When Metallica auditioned Jason's replacement, uh, among the people they spoke to, uh, there was Scott Reeder of the Stoner Rock, Caius, who's an amazing player, but perhaps a little bit laid back and not technical enough for Metallica. There was Twiggy Ramirez, who had played with Marilyn Manson's band, um, a great player, but perhaps he didn't quite have the sort of ballsy energy that they required. Um, and the man they ultimately recruited was Rob Trujillo, who had been in Suicidal Tendencies, and in, he had his own uh, funk rock side project called Infectious Grooves. Now, what they were looking for in a bass player, I think, was someone who obviously was uh, technically proficient enough to be able to handle it. And in fact, Lars said later of the other guys that he thought they, that the songs were about 10% too difficult for their skills. But also someone who could um, push them. What, what James and Lars said about Rob when they recruited him was that he pushes us to achieve. Rob said himself that his, his ethos in life is to step up, always to take the next step. And when you watch the scene in Some Kind of Monster when Rob is playing his audition, he chose to play Battery, one of the toughest songs they do. You can see him standing there sort of nonchalantly knocking out this riff, while the other guys are sort of almost playing up to his standard, not the other way around. Robert Gilo just, I always regard him as one of the best bass players I've ever seen. Oh, he's an excellent bassist. You know, one of, uh, I, I met him when he was still in Suicidal Tendencies, a really nice guy too. He's phenomenal. He's an incredible bass player. He is incredible. He was incredible. I remember seeing Slayer at Ruthie's Inn. He was just all over the, all over the place. Robert Chihiro is a very talented bassist on stage. He's probably a better player technically than either Cliff Burton or Jason Newstead. But if anybody's going to make a difference to that band, they have to be an equal partner and not a hired hand. And Robert Chihiro is a hired hand for Metallica. He's hired to play bass, do it very, very well. Absolutely very well. He's a dynamo on stage, but is he going to make any difference where it really matters in the studio when it comes to writing new songs and taking a lead in terms of Metallica's direction? I don't think so. With Robert Trujillo in the band, 
a new album to promote, and the issues built up over the decades melting away, Metallica went on tour. But surprise, surprise, not everybody liked the new album. The reason why St. Anger sounded the way it did was because they had an agenda behind it. They weren't just putting out an album with some songs. What they wanted to do was strip back everything, all the baggage that had accumulated over the decades, and go back to the old style and just produce a raw blast of musical fury. Now, while that approach is to be uh, is to be applauded, and in fact they bigged it up hugely before the record was released. This is the heaviest album, this is the fastest, it's extreme, it's this, that and the other. When it actually came out, everyone was ready for this, and there was this enormous disappointment because in fact it isn't that heavy, it isn't that fast, it isn't that exciting, it's not that powerful. They've, they've just lost sight of who they are, and, and, and uh, are, are just kind of like, as people say, they're, they're, they're just kind of in this, this big loop, and I don't think they've, they've, they've really just kind of forgotten where they come from and what they were supposed to be. The talent is still there, if the will is still there. Now, I feel that Lars and James are so far apart now, the only thing holding them together is the fact that they're in the same band. And even then, they're not quite sure why they're in the same band. I think they need something radical. I think they need to shake up that band. And you know how I'd shake it up? i bring back Dave Mustaine. I think you put Mustaine back in that band with Hepfield, with Ulrich, and with whoever on bass, get, I get Newstead back. I think you can actually have a great album in the making. But they need to shake things up because to be honest, there's no connection between Lars Ulrichs, traveling the world, hanging out with celebrities, buying art and following trendy music, and James Hetfield getting more and more into the redneck lifestyle, hunting, listening to country music, wearing cowboy boots. There's no connection between the two lifestyles anymore. And they come together and probably look at each other and say, who are you? Why are we sitting together? You put something like Mustaine into the, into the mix as a catalyst, and I think then you have the real possibility of Metallica making another great album. And I'd like to see something of that radical nature it's one of those things where, you know, they've accomplished so much, you know, it's like, where do you go from here, you know? So now I think it's good, you know, it's important that they, like, you know, have fun with it, you know, have fun and just remember what it was about, you know? It's hard when you get older and you got, you know, your bank accounts are just like, you know, you can buy anything you want and you can do anything you want and go wherever you want. It's like, what do you do, you know? It's, you gotta, Hard to stay hungry when you're in that kind of situation. Not necessarily more fun now than it was. It's just, it's, you know, we've always maximized when you said that, you know, every situation we've been in, whatever level it's been at, we've always tried to get the most out of it. How you feeling? Feeling good. I uh, stopped drinking. <laughs> you really? You're on the wagon? I'm on the wagon and uh, my nerves are shot, but other than that, you know, <laughs> I'm uh, holding it together somewhat. So we're proud of what, what we've done and what we do. Okay, the last one is, how longer do you feel uh, you can go? I mean, can you picture yourself? With this interview? <laughs> <laughs> one more question. <laughs> I think, I do think. You feel like you could be like the Rolling Stones with like 50. <laughs> hey! <laughs> yeah. Interesting, man. I, you know, I'm not a prophet. I'm, I'm horrible at planning things. I, I can't, you know, that's why I got a wife, I think, but. I'm, I, I'm not a prophet. When it doesn't feel right anymore, we're, we're done. Yeah. Thank you very much. Great. Now I did the work